Today, we're continuing the story of the children of Israel on their journey from Egypt, the land of their slavery, to Canaan, their promised land. Do you remember the part of the story that Brian spoke about last week? God providing manna, food in the wilderness. And Don, the week before, at harvest, God holding back the Red Sea, so his people, probably well over two million, could cross and escape the Egyptian army. And before that, Graham spoke on Passover, when as the tenth plague, the angel of death killed the firstborn male of every family not showing faith in God by painting the blood of a slaughtered lamb around their doorway. Each week, the story has been packed with incredible miracles, but each miracle took place in the context of extreme disaster conditions, slavery, persecution, starvation. But then miracles come in desperate times. That's when we really pray from the heart. This week, those same people are thirsty. No, nope, very, very thirsty walking through the scorching hot, dusty, dry desert. Of course they were thirsty, absolutely parched and dehydrated. So what do they do? Just as before, they start complaining, blaming their leader, Moses, for, for rescuing them from slavery, for doing the impossible and enabling them to escape brutal oppression under one of the world's most powerful regimes. They blamed him rather than thanking him. Now, apart from the fact that, if we are honest, we probably do the same thing, it's easy to wonder how on earth they could overlook that almighty God, Yahweh, was taking infinite care of them, all two million plus of them even to the extent that their shoes never wore out. They didn't need to remember to look back to last week or last month to know that their God was unmistakably and powerfully providing for them. What were they eating every single day? Manna, bread from heaven, which they gathered six days out of seven as none fell on the Sabbath. Read Exodus 16. And how did they know which way to go? They had the best satnav ever. God didn't just tell them the way to go, he showed them the way and protected them at the same time. His presence with them could be seen as this huge cloud, described as a column or a pillar of cloud that went in front of them providing shade in the daytime with fire pulsating through it in the darkness and cold of the desert night. If the pillar moved, they moved. If the pillar stopped, they stopped. Sometime after this, God told Moses to make the tabernacle, a portable version of what would later be God's holy temple in Jerusalem. And then each time they set up camp, when the pillar of God stopped moving, it would hover over the tabernacle, an inescapable sign of his presence, power and care. And the whole camp, at least two million people, would be set up neatly and in tribal order in relation to the central tabernacle. God was in the midst. So here is a mighty horde of people feeling thirsty. Now what? Had God made an error of judgment in bringing them here? Had he suddenly abandoned them? Had he forgotten their needs? Or was there simply nowhere that could possibly provide water 
for two million people and cattle were they all about to slowly die. They started a protest. Yes, another one. We want water. We want water. And they meant business. Of course, Moses, in desperation, does the right thing and asks ask God, just as we might pray, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And God tells him what to do. He says, take the staff, which he, God, had symbolically used in several ways in Egypt before Pharaoh and at the Red Sea, a sign of Moses' leadership and his connection with Yahweh. God said, go to the rock at Horeb and hit the rock with the staff and then water will come out of it for the people to drink. Children's Bible illustrations of this miracle often show not much more than a trickle of water flowing from the rock, a trickle destined to fill millions of jars and stomachs. It must have been more than that, or we can be sure they would have kept right on complaining. So once again, God met the physical needs of his people. We can learn so much from this amazing picture of the wanderings of God's people in the desert around three and a half thousand years ago during the late Bronze Age. But that doesn't mean just studying the historical record. We too are God's people. I am God's child. Does he provide for me? Does he give me spiritual bread? Does he give me living water? Does he set me free from spiritual slavery or bondage? Yes, 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 and yes. Back then, all those people and animals drank their fill and then took as much as possible with them and kept on walking. Looking at a map, we might wonder how it could take so long to walk the 350 miles from Egypt to Israel across the top of the Sinai Peninsula, the most direct route, even given the heat and the massive number of people and livestock. But for a start, they didn't take any of the three more direct trade routes, probably because they could have been chased and tracked by the Egyptian army. Oh no, there isn't any army left, is there? But still, they would have been too traceable probably it was more likely that God knew they would take time to be transformed from a rabble of slaves to a race of soldiers, to be ready to conquer the inhabitants of Canaan. There was so much work to do on them, both as a nation and as individuals. This was to be their time of preparation. This was their boot camp. God hadn't chosen them because there was anything intrinsically outstanding about them, but because they were the descendants of Abraham, of whom he had promised to make a great nation. He had set his love upon them. He knew they needed training to trust him and to obey him. He knew that that would take time, a long time. Part of the training would be working together to create that massive work of art and worship, the tabernacle or tent of meeting. In the desert, God expected and enabled Moses to oversee the production of this complex and magnificent structure. Absolutely incredible. Sadly, perhaps the tabernacle is not included in this current sermon series, but that's because it's such an important standalone subject in itself. If you have the inclination, it's well worth the private study, looking at what everything means, as well as all the different elements. It was hugely costly in terms of time, effort, and money, resulting in very clear evidence of God's presence and relationship with his people. The Lord of all the universe 
had given himself a location. It was constructed according to his precise details, measurements, colours, decoration, furniture, materials, use, nothing was missed. There were even strict instructions about deconstruction and transportation. As you can read in Exodus, God gave them an almost impossible task to work on, together with worship of himself as it, at its centre, ingredients to help towards making them a cohesive and great nation. And he faithfully continued leading them closer and closer to the promised land. Then the time came when God told Moses to send ahead 12 spies to see what lay in store for them in Canaan. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, brought back exciting descriptions and proof of the fantasticness of the promise with the conclusion, we can do it. However, the other ten were fearful. It's too dangerous. It's too difficult. We're doomed to fail. So, effectively, Israel, having come this far, refused to enter the promised land. And as a result, God delayed their entry by another 38 years, till all the adults of that time, apart from Joshua and Caleb, had died. We have lived in Frinton for 30 years now, so I know 38 years is a very long time to wait. This can be another helpful picture for us. In our spiritual lives, Have we left Egypt, left behind the self-centred lifestyle of our past, but still feel something is missing? Are we still somewhere between Egypt and Canaan, not yet really enjoying joy and freedom that we'd hoped for? Do we need someone to help us move forward in our faith? If so, do find someone to talk to, to help. I've gone beyond the story in today's reading because there came a second recorded time after the creation of the tabernacle, after the refusal to enter Canaan, when the people again started to protest, we want water, complaining against Moses and God. Again, God told Moses to take his staff but this time to speak to the rock, and water would flood out. And God did indeed meet the need of the people with floods of water, but Moses had made the biggest mistake of his life. In his anger and frustration at the attitude of the people, instead of just speaking to the rock, as God had said, he hit the rock twice God was not pleased, but that isn't part of today's story. For me, part of the delight in studying this story was the discovery that this second provision of water probably happened in Petra, that rose-red city half as old as time, the place I got so excited about when I last visited Israel and Jordan, Petra, actually meaning rock, with its towering rose stone cliffs, either side of a narrow water-carved wadi or valley, a dried up riverbed called a seek. I remember Aaron's tomb high above us at the top of the cliff, Aaron, Moses' brother, who also died before entry into the promised land but I'd never made that connection. Interestingly, in these two accounts, the original words for the rocks which gushed water for thirsty Israelites are different from each other. The first is a smaller word, as in large boulder, maybe. And this second indicates a massive cliff face. Both times it's likely that God tapped in 
pardon the pun, to underground water-bearing layers of porous rock called aquifers, which of course he knew were there. They are often some way below the Earth's surface all round the world, including in areas of drought, so near yet so far. An astounding 600 million people today still don't have access to clean water. And sub-Saharan African women alone walk for 40 billion hours every year just collecting water instead of being educated or earning a living. And yet the water is often already there, beneath their feet. They don't have a Moses to help, but they could have us. We're very proud of our daughter, Sam, who raised money and probably more significantly oversaw the whole process of two wells being provided when she was volunteering in New Delhi slums, where the children and families had no clean water. And after speaking this sermon this morning, someone mentioned that in the Church of England newspaper, the month in the middle, there is a leaflet about water aid called Gulp. Um, if you fancied helping out in some practical way, presumably money, um, that would be a way of helping. Shockingly, disease from polluted drinking water kills a child every minute. And more people every year die from this than all forms of violence combined, including wars. Don't we take fresh, clean water for granted? We do appreciate it when we stop to think, but probably don't value it as much as we, we should or realise how very privileged we are. Often it's when we don't have something or when we suddenly feel a desperate need for it that we learn to appreciate it. On a hot day, after a long walk, when we have a tickle in our throat, water is especially wonderful. It meets our need, our craving. But how often do we crave spiritual refreshment? How often do we cry out to God for his water of life? How thirsty are we for more of God, more of his spirit? Like Moses in the wilderness, like many drought-ridden places around the world, the water is there just for the asking. Let's ask God for the water of life. Because as Jesus said to the Samaritan woman he met at a well, whoever drinks the water I give them will never be thirsty again. In fact, the water I give them will become in them a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. Amen.